is called Mission Impossible. Mission Impossible. And uh, it's quite a um, good situation that happened this week. Kind of failed to have been recognised by what, what's been going on over in Chile. And the wonderful rescue of the 33 uh, in the shelter there, the 33 uh, men who have been rescued. Here's the reading of God's Word, John 3, 36. It's not on there, it's in the Bible. John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. That's it. It's really uh, just summing up everything that's gone on in this chapter. And saying, you know, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. That's what uh, that the new birth is eternal life. That's what John has been saying uh, all along. But whoever rejects the Son will not see life, but God's wrath remains upon him. And really, this is the mission which is impossible. Here we say, see two ways to live. We see two ways to die. We see two responses to be made. We see two present realities as a result of this. And we see, we experience two present realities and we will encounter a fruition of those realities. We will enter into the experience of it. But yeah, it's been marvellous, hasn't it? These miners coming out, you know, the three boreholes that they started to bore in the desert, in San Jose, wherever it is, in that mine. And they had three, three holes they were being dug, and it was hole B that got there, got down to the bottom. And, you know, it was expected it was going to be December before they got down there. But borehole B got down there in two months. They were been down there for two months. For 17 days they were down there before they were able to get a note out to say the 33 are safe in the shelter. And I know the uh, Chilean Prime Minister has come to see the Queen and Cameron Apple hasn't he? And given her and him a piece of stone from the miners and, and a copy of the letter saying the 33 are safe uh, in the shelter. 635 metres uh, under the earth's crust, below the desert, for 69 days. That's quite amazing. And th this borehole yet came and was made about 24 inches wide. And uh, the Chilean Navy created this capsule to go down, didn't they, called the Phoenix, um, which went down and brought uh, these uh, miners one by one back up to the surface, rescued, rescued, reconciled, not only rescued, redeemed from death in the pit of the earth, rescued, redeemed, reconciled, back to their loved ones and families, and restored, back to the surface, back out of darkness and into his light in the only way possible, through the shaft, in the only thing that they could stand in and trust in was the capsule that they had to go into, the phoenix, which they stepped into, which took them up. Can't you see there's some colorations here between that and the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, of the way that the Father has brought to us in the person of Jesus Christ. It's so much uh, similar. Whoever believes in the Son receives eternal life. Some of the miners said this. One miner said, my underground bunker was hell. Another one said, I have been near God and I have been near the devil. And they had a fight and God has won. Another said, I have been with the devil but I grabbed God's hand and I knew he would bring me up. You know, there was an evangelical preacher down there. Protestant preacher down there who saw those children miners and they sent Bibles down and uh, they were reading the scriptures down there, they were praying to God down there 
Did you notice when they come out? Did you know if you notice they all have these brown stuffy t-shirts on? And it had a, a text and scripture on the back. It was from the Psalms, I forgot what it was now, but it was from the Psalms. You can check it out on YouTube. And on the sleeve of the t-shirt it said Jesus. You notice when they came up out the darkness, out the abyss, many of them got down on their knees. They prayed to God. It be religious society, but evangelical Christianity there is at 17% rising. Many, probably, no doubt, were born again believers <coughs> in the Lord Jesus in that day. But it's a wonderful thing. For all Humanity, like in that pit of the earth, in that mine, all of humanity is entombed in their own depravity, isn't it? We also were once entombed, if we are believers today, we were no better. We were once entombed with our own depravity and sin, close to death, close to hell, close to the devil. Some of us may still be underground, as it were, spiritually, in darkness and separated from God and without hope, living a life as here with God's wrath upon us. This is a, a very challenging text in Scripture for us here before us uh, today because, you know, it tells us there's two ways to live, there's two ways to die, there's two destinies. It doesn't say that we're all going to the same place. It tells us that God is actually angry as well. It's not just that God is a God of love and that God loves everybody. It says that actually God is God's wrath remains on people. So God is angry in a righteous way, in a just way with, with individuals. It tells, tells us here that God's wrath remains upon people. So I want to just briefly look at this uh, text, the two human responses. Firstly, belief in the Son. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. This is more than just simply believing that one and one is two. This is more than just mere head knowledge that I believe that Jesus is God and he's saved. It's more than knowledge, oh I know that Jesus died on the cross and he died for my sins. It's more than just that sort of belief. It's, it's of a personal trust, of personally trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whoever personally trusts in the Son has an eternal life. You know, for those people down there, when they set the capsule down, the phoenix down into the earth's core, and we saw it down there, didn't we? It was amazing. And it's down there. You know, it's, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? You know, you're not going to say, no, you, you go on up, mate. You go on up. I don't want to jump in that capsule. I don't want to personally step into that. Uh, you know, I believe it's there, but I, I'm going to stay down here. You know, when that capsule came, one by one, those miners stepped in. They personally uh, trusted uh, in that <coughs> capsule that would take them up. They responded. That application is that Jesus is that capsule, isn't it? That Jesus is that capsule, and that we. If we believe on him, if we trust in him, whoever believes shall receive eternal life. That's the, the, the first response. Whoever believes in him shall receive eternal life. The alternative is horrifying, really, because whoever believes in him shall receive eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life. So if you believe, you receive life. If you do not believe, if you reject, you don't see life. In fact, no, if you do not see life, God's wrath also remains upon you. So the thing is here, that Jesus didn't come in to condemn the world. We stand condemned already, as we've seen that earlier in the passage. Jesus actually came into a world, if they're miners, were down in that pit, and that capsule hadn't come down, and they hadn't drawn a ball, they would have had it, wouldn't they? And they, 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 if they just stayed there, and the capsule, and the capsule came down, and they said, "No, I don't want to go," they've had it. Mm -hmm. They have to personally trust. They have to personally get into that capsule to take them back up. Jesus comes down into this world, and people are condemned. 
They aren't not going to see life in the condition that they are. God's wrath abides in them. But Jesus in the capsule comes down and he says, whoever believes, whoever steps into me, can be taken up and can be rescued. And so that is our condition. That is our response. Have we made that response? Now what is it to personally trust? No, it's faith, isn't it? Well, what is faith? Faith is knowing. Faith is believing. And faith is personally trusting. Imagine you're down that San Pedro mine in Chile. There's 33 men trapped down there. The capsule arrives 695 metres down. But one of the men says, he sees it there, he has the knowledge about it, but for some reason he's round the corner somewhere. He's got, is that what he's at the moment? Yeah, no, he has the knowledge, he sees the capsule, he has the knowledge about the capsule, but he doesn't, he doesn't get in. He doesn't want it. Another guy, he has the knowledge about the capsule, and he believes it can save him. But actually, he, he likes it down here. He, he likes it. And then you might say, oh, well, that's ridiculous. Of course they were stopped down there. But this is what people do in the world. People believe that they have the knowledge about Jesus, and they believe that Jesus can save them. And we're just talking about, uh, Richard just gave me this. You know? You know, he, you know, he talks about Lucifer. He doesn't want, he doesn't want to. He, he, talks about, you know, he doesn't talk about Jesus, but if he's talking about Lucifer, he'll know about Jesus. <laughs> and he says, what, what's his name? Keith Richards. Keith Richards. He says, I, I, don't want, I, don't want, I want to be with Lucifer. I want, I want to be with the devil. And uh, so it comes down, the person's got knowledge, he believes, but he actually likes it down here, so he doesn't step into the capsule. That's nonsense, of course, but that's what happens in the world. And then the other person, he, he knows about the capsule, he believes the capsule can save him, but like those 33 miners, they personally trust, they personally get in, into the capsule, and are saved. But it's not their faith that saves them. It's not their knowledge that saves them, it's not their, their belief that saves them, it's Jesus that saves them. It's the capsule that saves them, isn't it? And, and that's what it's true for us. We don't save ourselves. Jesus comes into this world and saves us. We have a response to make, as it were. We have a step to make, personally trusted in Christ. But it's Jesus who saves. And then the rejection here. It's horrific, isn't it? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son shall not see life. This, it's, it's a strong word, this rejection. It's, it basically, it's not trusting. It's not that they're not It's disobedience. They disobeyed. It, it's, 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 it's the fact that they're disobedient. The person has chosen to remain in condemnation. Jesus comes to say to give you a hand out, and yet they choose, actually, I like it. I like my life. Keith Richards, I like my life. I like it how it is. And it, I like my disobedience. I like to live my life. And you might not think, well, it's not just sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's, you might live a morally upright life and be a good religious person. But you're lost and without hope because you've not personally trusted in Christ. You're trusting in your words, your own goodness to save you. And it's, it's disobedience. Like Nicodemus, he was a deeply religious man. And yet Jesus said to him, look, you, are, you, you go to the synagogue, you're, you're part of the Sanhedrin, you fast, you pray, but you must be born again. And so it, it, can, it can go either way. You know, it doesn't, it's not just the sex drugs and rock and roll person, it's the morally good and upright person. Because the Bible says no one is righteous. You see, that we're, not in, we're not the good guys and the bad guys. We're all in the same ballpark. We've all got this decision to make. We either reject it and say, no way, you're or really or wrong. Hmm? Or we say, yes, I believe that and I perceive that and I know Christ for myself and my Saviour and my Lord. It's black and white when it comes to the Gospel. And here we see it. Jesus lays it on the line. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever rejects the Son shall not see life. 
Let's just t- turn to Ephesians with me, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, and we see the need why, why we need Jesus. And that we can't do it ourselves. The capsule needs to come down into this world. And the, and the amazing thing is this, is the very fact that we step into that capsule, Jesus, the very fact that we trust in Jesus, is because God has put his hand upon you. And he's pulled you. He's pulled you. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, As for you, you were dead in your transgress- transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature, and following its desire and thoughts like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. So you hear what he's saying, he's saying, by nature we are objects of wrath. And that God's wrath abides upon people. Upon all of us. And this is what he's speaking to believers who once were this, past tense, but now present tense, have come to receive and believe on the Lord Jesus. And the abiding wrath of God does not abide upon you any longer. But the love of God, and the grace of God, and the mercy of God, and the the very fact of life rests upon you now. By choosing to reject the Son, we are actually choosing our sinful nature. As a result, we will remain in our depravity. We remain in darkness, we remain under condemnation, because this is what we choose. This is what gratifies our desires. This is what we want, this is what we like, this is what we enjoy. This is what we enjoy being. Whatever that might be. We're all the same. None of us are better than anyone. We are all the same. We were all, by nature, objects of God's wrath. But because of his great love, look at that Ephesians 2 verse 4, because of his great love for us, God who is rich in mercy made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. He's made us alive in Christ. We don't make ourselves alive in Christ. It's the new birth. It's the Spirit of God that makes us alive in Christ. None of our works make us alive in Christ. We are saved by Christ and in Christ to do good works. But not as a result are we saved by them. So there's two responses, a negative rejection of disobedience really, of remaining in darkness, remaining dead in our trespasses and sins spiritually. That's where we all were. We were all born there. There is no difference and yet there are those that receive him and they are given eternal life. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. And then, and then we have two present day experience. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. You see that? That little word, has. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Not eternal life, oh, I'm going to heaven. You know, I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Has eternal life. That has eternal life right now. You have eternal life right now. And it's a realised ex- eschatology. It's a realised of the future hope. You realise it. You experience peace with God. You know that your sins are forgiven. You know that you're born of God of above because of the abiding Spirit of God. And that you, you, you're living eternal life right now here in the present. That's why you know, it says you've come to have life. Come to give you life in all its fullness. It's a, it's a, it's a realisation. There's some wonderful experiences in this world, isn't there, to enjoy. Life-changing experiences. The birth of a child. The exhilaration of driving at speed. The euphoria of a rescue. When all seemed lost. The victory of a win in the height of your sport. The satisfaction of a job well done. 
the breathtaking view before your eyes, the success of your business, the joy of sex within the context of marriage. All these can be present day experience which bring much pleasure, purpose and peace to our lives. But none can compete with the daily experience of possessing eternal life. And I don't think we need, to, we, we need to understand what we possess, what we have. Because I think we don't. What we really have is eternal life in the present. God has given his Holy Spirit into our lives to lead and guide, guide us through our lives, to be his hands and his feet and his eyes and his mouths. He's bringing a change. There's a change going on in our lives from what we were when we were in condemnation to what we are now. You know, God forbid that we still stay there. You know, it's like when you say, you know, I've just been born again. Well, that's just the beginning. You know, we're going on, we're being moved, it's sanctification, we're changed, we're being changed. And because that is God's spirit living, because eternal life abides in us. You know, we're not just one dimensional, physical, we're here and now, the present. We are heavenly minded people. Heavenly minded. Living a new life, a changed life. And it's a present reality. Of course it is true to be absent from the body is present with the Lord. And as Jesus told his, his disciples, you know, I tell you the truth, you know, I've prepared a place for you and I've gone and prepared that place and I'll come back and take you to be where I am. He told his disciples that's true, isn't it? But he's talking about eternal life now. Has eternal life. Not going to get it when they die. We've already got it. That's why a believer's funeral, I've taken many funerals, but a believer's funeral is a joyous affair. It's like a wedding ceremony. It's a celebration. It's a joy of thanksgiving for the life. It's a grief, the loss, for, for, our, for our loss and the loved ones. They're absent from us. But it's a joy in that we know that that eternal life that they experienced throughout their years has come to fruition. And it's a joyous affair. How different is it for an unbeliever? How different. On the other side of the coin, whoever rejects the Son will not see life. Whoever rejects the Son will not see life. I don't, you know, there's many ways you can think about this, but I suppose the people, what does this mean? Well, people are living out their lives without seeing Jesus, without knowing God. They're living one-dimensional lives. You know, they're not, they haven't got life in all its fullness. They haven't got God dwelling with them because they've rejected. They're living a life which is not abundant. They're not living an abundant life. But more than this, also, they will not see life, of course, in the future eschatology framework of things. They won't be part of heaven and part of the new heavens and the new earth. They, they, their end will be the bottomless pit, which never ends, and then the second death, which is the lake of fire. Which, is, you know, is horrendous. They will not see life. This is a challenge, isn't it, to people who think, you know, God is God of love and everybody's going to go to heaven and be heaven. Well, what do you do with this scripture? What do you do with this verse? You know, some people have got these rose-tinted spectacles that God is so loving and compassionate, he will forgive everybody. But that's not the case here, is it? You know, there's, there's, two, there's two opposites, as it were. You know, the, the, they, they, they create a God of their own imagination. They don't create a God of the Bible. They don't bring out the true character of God from the whole of the Bible, from the whole of the Scriptures. You can't take one part and reject the other. God is justifiably angry. That's sin. He has come to rescue people. He doesn't want to condemn people. He's come to save people. And yet, ultimately, if we remain disobedient and carry on in our ways without God, 
ultimately, you know, I mean, anywhere. Somebody who's lived a life like that, just like Keith Richards, he wouldn't want to go to heaven. In, in this article, in there, he doesn't want to go to heaven, does he, Richard? He's quite happy. And to be honest, somebody who's lived a life who's disobedient, has had no thought for God in this life, how would they possibly enjoy their place in heaven? They wouldn't enjoy it. But they've chosen the opposite. And God gives them, really, what, what they really want. We're all in the same boat. We were all there. But there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. The only difference between a believer and a non-believer is that of personally receiving Jesus Christ. So it is. It's simple. It's not difficult. It's not complicated, is it? Repent and believe. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There is no condemnation, the Bible says, for those who are in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. You've got to be in. You've got to be in the, the capsule. You've got to be in Christ Jesus. But those who reject will not see life. So two future events will be encountered. Firstly, the abiding wrath of God. Death will be encountered by all the death races. Well, we know as I'm speaking, every second people are dying and passing into eternity. And one day it will be me and it will be you. Unless the Lord returns, we'll be taken alive, those who are in the Lord. But we shall all die. And the reason for death <coughs> is sin. The wages of sin is death. Death came as a result of the fall of Adam and Eve. And we by nature are children of Adam and Eve. And there is where we are born and shaped and live in this disobedience before God. And we are storing up, as it were, for God's wrath remains on him. Is it, you know, God's wrath remained on me for 30 years. And I was saved. God's wrath remained on you people in, in here for a certain amount of time and then at some point you were saved. You know better. God's wrath is still being stored up upon people out there just like you and me. And, and it's being built up and built up until all hell will break loose. In Romans chapter 2, verses 5 to 9, it says, Because of your stubbornness, stubborn, stubbornness, and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath. This idea of storing up, the wrath of God abides. You're storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will give to each person according to what he has done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honour and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and who follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. Those who persistently reject the truth and the offer of Jesus Christ as our Saviour and Lord will not only fail to see life, but God's wrath remains upon them. It's horrific. There will be no miscarriages of justice. On the 15th of November 2002, Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley, died. Myra Hindley, do you remember her? She served a life sentence from 1966 to 2002. She served 36 years in prison and died without release at the age of 60. Towards the end of her life, there were those who were appealing her sentence, calling for her release as she was a reformed character. All human imprisonments come to an end. Life very rarely these days means life, does it? For Myra Hindley, it did. But not these days. 
But in Myra's case, life meant life. But even for Myra, death severed that sentence. It came to an end. But the future event of judgment and of God's wrath, of not seeing life, the abiding wrath of God is never ending. It cannot be severed through death. It cannot be worked your way out of it. You can't, but begins on death and it cannot be appealed in this life to come. So we must cry out today for salvation. The abiding wrath of God in hell is for all eternity. And so I plead with anyone who has not yet trusted Christ to turn from disobedience and believe in the Son and experience eternal life and the joys of the future. What is the second future event? The, the, the New Jerusalem, isn't it? Look at the inv invitation in Revelation 21 and verses 1 to 8. See, I saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for a husband, and I heard a loud voice. That's us, that bride. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, work, work, Now is the dwelling of God is with men who will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and he be their God, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. The old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne and said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it's done, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this and I will be his God and he will be my son. But the cowardly the unbelieving, not the, not the paedophile, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Thus speaks the word of God. I want to leave you with the, the last words of one Chilean miner who was rescued. He said, I've been with the devil, for I grabbed, I grabbed God's hand, and I knew he would bring me up. That's where we all are. We've all been with the devil. All of us. But if we're believers in Christ, we've grabbed God's hand, and he has brought us up. Praise be to God. And thanks to his holy name. Amen. We're going to uh, just pray and then Richard's going to sing. We're going to sing our closing hymn, which will be on the the altar. Almighty God, there are two ways to live and two ways to die. Almighty God, we thank you for that rescue mission that you have come into this God-forsaken world. And you are rescuing people. I thank you that you rescue people. I want to pray for that woman I spoke with last night, Lord. I, I don't know her name. And I know, Lord, she needs your rescue. And I pray, Lord, that you would rescue her. And that she would really come to know you. And you would change her life and heal her, Lord. And restore the fruit to her life. I pray, Heavenly Father, for each one of us that we might know that we've been rescued. That we've been with the devil, but he grabbed, but we've grabbed God's hand, and we know he will bring us up. And we thank you that indeed he will. That if we confess with our mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, the Bible says, <coughs> we shall be saved. Praise God for that. And so, Lord, 
May each one of us know our salvation. May we have the abiding presence of eternal life in the here and now. May we be filled with joy as we wait in eager expectation of our, the glorious fruition to come and the hope of glory. So may your peace and your abiding presence rest upon each one, I pray. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Amen.